so good morning uh, everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, third session of uh, space for critical infrastructure uh, this is actually the last uh, webinar of the introductory part um, so my name is Cornel Bogart I will host this uh, session and I work for Eurizi, which is a non-profit association based in Paris and we um, we aim to promote uh, satellite applications and uh, throughout this series um, yeah we aim to do this uh, specifically for the monitoring and maintenance of uh, critical infrastructure uh, so if you have been following the series uh, already a bit uh, you know that we um, we follow the proposed uh, directive on the resilience of critical entities which aims to set up um, an uh, all hazards uh, EU framework that supports uh, the member states uh, in their national efforts uh, to ensure uh, that critical entities are able to uh, recover uh, but also absorb and resist um, disruptive incidents um, and this can be all inclusive so this is natural hazards this is accidents terrorism uh, all kinds of uh, threats and uh, health emergencies for instance um, and so the webinar series, it's organized uh, together with our partner uh, Nereus. Uh, so maybe uh, Margarita, if you would like to uh, say a few yes. words, please go ahead. Thank you, Cornel. So it's our pleasure to organize these uh, webinars jointly with Eurisi. Uh, Nereus is the network of European regions using space technologies. We represent the interests of European regions um, and we explore and promote the use of space and the benefits of space technologies for European regions and their uh, citizens. Uh, wish you a great uh, and fruitful uh, webinar and uh, the floor is back to you, Cornel. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Margarita. Um, and so let's uh, let's jump in right away. So um, I mean, just uh, first, um, I would like to also say that um, everyone can, um, if there are any questions, just uh, write them down in the chat. We will try to um, to answer all the questions after the presentations. Um, and just also as a general uh, reminder, so the overall objective behind the series is really to sensitize, sensitize the added value of uh, space-based assets and applications um, to address uh, the, the monitoring and safeguarding of, of critical entities. And so uh, today we have with us uh, Philip Mosley from the European Commission to share uh, some opportunities and uh, views uh, for uh, the green and digital transition uh, in the construction uh, sector. So, uh, Philip Mosley, uh, you can um, now share your screen and you have the floor now. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, nice to nice to meet you all. And uh, I will uh, I'll just share my my PowerPoint uh, and I'll put it on full screen. Can you see the correct slides there, or is it maybe I need to? Yes, we we can see the slides, but it's not yet in presentation mode. Uh, like that? No, it's still uh, in the overview. Uh, uh, okay, I will. I'll share the. Sorry, I will share the PowerPoint instead of the screen then. Um, and it's going to be that. Yes, now it works perfect. Okay. Great. So, um, yes, uh, my name is Philippe Mosley. I work in the construction unit in DG Crow, the Director General for Internal Market Industry, Entrepreneurship and SMEs in the, in the European Commission. And, and there I'm responsible for um, policies to do with the, the green transition of construction, as we now call it. Um, we are, we're working on this thing called a transition pathway where we have the green and digital transitions working together. And, uh, and I work on, on the green part, which in practice, that means everything to do with um, circular economy, resource efficiency, and also energy and energy efficiency uh, in, in buildings. Um, so, uh, but also infrastructure, of course, when it comes to circular economy. Um, right, I will move to my next slide. So, when we talk about construction, uh, the construction industry, we have the industry ecosystem. And uh, what this is, is it's coming out of the EU industrial strategy. It defines 14 industrial ecosystems, and construction is one of them. Uh, the ecosystem is a is a broader way of looking at uh, the industry. So beyond just the what we would normally call the sector, 
uh, and the ecosystem is the whole you know wider kind of supply chains and other stakeholders involved so in the sense of construction it's not only the industry itself but also some of the public authorities for example that are involved in permit processes and and that kind of thing um, so the the gross value added of the the ecosystem is uh, is big it's it's almost 10 percent of the EU gross value added uh, you can see there are millions of jobs uh, five million firms working in construction uh, of course the vast majority of them are, <clears throat> are SMEs or even micro enterprises and then we have the environmental impact of construction so it's the biggest single source of waste generated in the EU with with over a third uh, it uses um, around half of all resources extracted in the EU are destined for construction and of course construction is also responsible for greenhouse gas emissions and and the buildings that are constructed uh, also consume energy so it's it has a big impact so as I mentioned this transition pathway is what we're working on right now um, as uh, coming from this industrial strategy so what we've been doing um, for some months now, we've been working on this document. Um, we started with a staff working document that was published in December. Uh, and what that did was it set out scenarios for the transition uh, to be green, digital and resilient. Uh, scenarios by 2030. So it set out basically a series of actions. And that was consulted on. It was open for public consultation. We had more than 100 responses. We also presented it in various fora. Um, but the main um, way that we consult uh, with the industry and with the member states as well is through the high level construction forum. And we've been holding now more detailed thematic uh, discussions on various themes uh, to do with this uh, transition. And we're aiming to produce the transition pathway document uh, towards the end of this year and what that will do will be set out a series of further actions that need to be taken by the commission recommendations for member state action and also recommendations for industry action um, when it comes to circularity and circular economy in construction uh, there's a, a lot going on in different areas so what we have here on the slide are the two big strategies uh, on the left and right so on the left the circular economy action plan and on the right the renovation wave and under these there are a series of actions some of them here so the ones to do with waste reducing uh, or revising waste targets uh, end of waste criteria and also material recovery targets these are all relating to studies that are ongoing or or maybe in some cases close to finishing related in some way to the waste framework directive and the waste framework directive is the main legislation on waste uh, for construction it has a, a target uh, so by 2020 all member states had to um, divert from landfill at least 70 percent of their construction demolition waste but of course that was a 2020 deadline so um, there may be a, a revision of the directive in future to to revisit that and to look at other um, issues like this then we have a, a, a roadmap for um, whole life carbon in buildings um, which I will get onto in a moment in a bit more detail because the the whole life carbon is a whole issue in itself and I will explain that uh, we have some action on green public procurement so procurement is a is a big way in which uh, particularly um, local level city level and regions can influence construction uh, because they are in charge of procuring very often uh, for their local area and on procurement we also have an initiative at the bottom there called big buyers which is bringing together um, uh, the, the major procurers so major cities but also national infrastructure procurement bodies um, and they are exchanging best practices and also speaking to the industry about what is best practice or what's what's the best possible um, that they could then put in their procurement um, and the big buyers initiative has a working group on circular construction and another one on on zero emission construction sites uh, among other working groups as well 
So I mentioned the whole life cycle of greenhouse gas emissions, and this is a, a really emerging policy area now. Um, over the last couple of years, really, this has become a quite a high priority. Um, what it basically means is that, uh, particularly for buildings, when you look at the emissions, until recently, we were mainly talking about the energy consumption of buildings. So decarbonizing buildings was thought of as decarbonizing the heating and cooling uh, and the renewable energy that you need on a building. But actually, when you look at the whole life cycle, uh, the construction part and the demolition part or the end of life, as we call it, at the end of um, uh, the lifetime uh, is also generating a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and we need to be tackling all of it. Um, so construction is a major um, producer of greenhouse gas emissions. So the way we've been tackling this is, first of all, we have the levels framework, and this is a framework that was developed um, a couple of years ago with 16 indicators to measure the sustainability performance of buildings. And one of those indicators is uh, global warming potential, which is, which is the greenhouse gas emissions. And this indicator is now making its way into various other policy files as a way of consistently measuring and reporting on the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of buildings and construction. Um, so we have uh, an ongoing action to develop a roadmap to reduce the life cycle emissions of buildings by 2050. That's coming under the renovation wave strategy. We also have now in the new proposal to um, revise the energy performance of buildings directive. We have some elements in there on life cycle emissions to do with uh, the construction of buildings. So we will have a deadline by 2027 for public buildings and for 2030 for all new buildings, they will have to calculate and declare their life cycle emissions. Uh, we also have some elements of this uh, part in the new proposal to revise the energy efficiency directive and also in the construction products regulation also under revision. So a lot of these things are being revised at the same time. We're making it, making sure that this issue is coherent across all of them. So in the construction products regulation, um, one of the provisions in the proposal now <clears throat> is that all construction products will have to, will have a mandatory uh, declaration of their uh, carbon footprint, their, their um, global warming potential, in other words, um, so that the data then, which also has to be digitally held for each product in a, in a product passport, uh, will be made available then for designers of buildings and infrastructure um, to calculate the life cycle emissions of the whole piece. So, so this is a, a you know a, a development, a recent development in uh, sustainable construction. And of course, one of the ways we can address and reduce life cycle emissions is by uh, by the circular economy. So, reuse and recycling of materials is a way of avoiding generating more emissions by um, you know more resource extraction and uh, and creating or manufacturing new materials so I, I mentioned the construction products regulation it's under review um, it's a it's a very complex piece of legislation so it's um, it hasn't been working very well until now especially for two aspects one was the single market uh, for construction products so it hasn't really been working out where if you put a construction product on the market in one member state, it's marketable or you know across the whole single market. Uh, there have been various problems with things like standardization and um, there's a backlog of standards now. Um, so uh, one of the aims of this uh, revision proposal is to empower the commission to intervene in the standardization process and, and clear this backlog. Uh, and then also integrating sustainability requirements into construction products. So not only the greenhouse gas emissions I mentioned, but other things like recycle content or other environmental um, aspects. Um, it will empower the commission to um, make product requirements. So for example, there might be for certain construction products, a minimum recycled content uh, introduced. 
Then we have uh, for construction or, or relevant to construction, a lot of different funding programs. Um, the big biggest one of all probably uh, in terms of, of money is uh, the recovery and resilience facility, which comes under the next generation EU uh, banner. And this facility is this, these numbers you see on the screen. Uh, it's the money made available to the member states for rebuilding or, or um, investments and reforms uh, coming out of COVID. Um, so to um, rebuild the economies, if you like. And most of the member states have an element there on building renovation. So um, that's a major part. Um, but there are also various other aspects relevant to construction in there, things like skills development. So we've been supporting the member states to make sure that when it comes to building renovation, they, they integrate as far as possible uh, those aspects of circular economy and, and resource efficiency that I mentioned. And then we also have, of course, um, other funding programmes, notably uh, the Horizon Europe programme for research and innovation. This has several different areas relevant in some way to buildings and construction and infrastructure um, but I can pick out the two probably most important ones. Uh, in cluster four um, there are some topics in there under a section called a new way to build and, and that really focuses on the green and digital transition of construction and in cluster five there's a partnership a public private partnership called built for people and that is looking across the whole value chain of construction and trying to accelerate deployment of uh, solutions for a sustainable built environment. So that, that is um, the, probably the most important partnership for um, construction in, in Horizon Europe. Uh, and of course there are other uh, funding programs doing various things, the cohesion um, funds, the, there's also the LIFE program which is sometimes relevant um, to construction. Uh, and and so on. And then another important uh, policy area that we've been working on is this EU finance taxonomy. And what this is, is um, uh, basically harmonizing an EU uh, definition, if you like, or, or criteria for green investment or sustainable investment. So it's having a common understanding of sustainable activities that then can be investable and uh, there are already out and published a criteria for climate change mitigation and adaptation investments so including for example investments in buildings but um, we're now working on the next and last four uh, sets of criteria so as you see at the bottom there water biodiversity pollution and circular economy they're being worked on at the moment uh, and they would define, uh, for example, um, civil engineering infrastructure, uh, um, which also contributes to a circular economy. Uh, so, so that's uh, an area of work as well. We have some um, uh, documents that we published uh, recently. We're continually doing studies. So uh, we have on the right a guidance document on circular economy principles for buildings design. It's, it's aimed at various target groups. It uh, explains the concepts. Uh, it sets out um, the a kind of guidance on how to achieve this uh, circular economy. It's also a, a useful reference document in itself. It was developed with industry and, and with the member states. And then on the left, with the same title, but a, a, a follow-up study that looked at policy options. And that's interesting because it gathered uh, a lot of case studies from across the EU, national policies, but also non-EU countries, OECD countries like uh, Israel, Canada, uh, Japan, I think is in there as well. Um, and it made some policy recommendations uh, for the circular economy in, in buildings. We also have this guidance document, which is a bit older, um, and we're looking to update it uh, in the near future, but it's still uh, current the Construction and Demolition Waste Management Protocol, and it's really a protocol to follow on, on site um, of how to manage and sort construction demolition waste, because that is one of the most important things to facilitate a circular economy is to 
when a building is demolished that it is not just smashed up but all of the the different elements are sorted and then um, categorized for reuse and recycling that was my uh, last slide i can just highlight on here uh, our website that's there with with uh, information on all of these things I mentioned and also there's a LinkedIn group if you're interested the EU construction ecosystem there so that enables you to keep up to date with what we're doing as well thanks a lot and I'll be happy to answer any questions thank you very much Philip for your insightful um, presentation I don't see any questions from the chat for now so just a quick reminder for everyone so if you have any questions don't uh, hesitate please uh, just uh, use the chat um, maybe if i may i can just uh, uh, ask you a quick uh, question so um, what, what do you think now is um, i mean just just to frame it because last year we had also another um, webinar session where we saw for instance uh, some regulatory barriers uh, that was done related to the monitoring of uh, pipelines um, and so we saw that in some countries, um, specific monitoring tools such as the use of satellite data, they were not really recognized. Um, so maybe some similar issues exist in the in the construction sector. Um, what would you say is the is the most important or the added value of uh, of EU policies in in the sector? Um, so yeah, that is the question. Um, well, I mean, it, it, it depends. The, the added value of what we try and do, at least in DG Grow, is we, we always try and harmonize um, the, across the single market because it doesn't make sense to have rules in only one country, uh, especially when it comes to um, you know, marketing of products or, or economic uh, activities. So we try and make sure that um, you know, rules are applicable across the whole single market. And that's what's behind you know the the construction products regulation um, revision. Um, I think that when it comes to something like monitoring infrastructure, um, it obviously benefits uh, you know saving capital investment costs if you if you can put that money into um, preventative maintenance rather than you know if if um, maintenance issues aren't tackled then. Uh, you end up with problems that then you know require major intervention and major cost so it definitely makes sense from an economic point of view to maintain infrastructure but also um, it, it actually makes sense from an environmental point of view as well because the, the longer we can keep infrastructure in its service life the better um, because it avoids creating new ones so um that that this thing of extending the service life is actually um you know uh, it's it's a an environmental goal as well as an economic one okay um and then so in the meantime i see that we have some uh, some other questions so first question is coming from um, matthew so interesting comment on the carbon footprinting of construction materials um in the forest product sector i understand there is a great deal of controversy about calculating the co2 potential any thoughts about how this proposal will break that roadblock yeah that's a good question so there is indeed a lot of discussion about um the Mer relative merits of different materials uh, so you know should we be uh, promoting wood uh, instead of concrete for example because concrete um, uses a generates a lot of greenhouse gases in its manufacturing or especially from the cement um, I think that w that's one of the things that this life cycle approach would do is to give designers the tools to understand the overall um, impact uh, the, the greenhouse gas impact but when it comes to wood specifically there's another issue which is the carbon storage and um, the commission does have plans to produce a, a certification scheme for carbon storage so a way of being able to certify how much carbon is stored in a uh, in a product uh, in, in a construction product, for example. So this, um, this element of carbon storage is also included in the construction products regulation revision. And, um, but 
the one of the issues is at the moment the standard for life cycle analysis doesn't include this carbon storage element so it would probably be a, a standalone separate uh, certification uh, whereas the overall life cycle analysis would, would just be for the emissions and not the storage and then maybe uh, one last question. Um, so do some of the various documents you mentioned in your presentation uh, contain um, provisions related to the use of earth observation in construction, uh, such as to monitor greenhouse gas uh, emissions? Um, I, th there's the transition pathway that I mentioned, which is the, the, the series of actions that we're looking at. I believe that there is something in there on, on Earth's observation. Um, uh, you know the relevance of that. Um, so uh, uh, and and you know we we'll certainly take that into account as we develop it because I think it is relevant, uh, especially um, for uh, some of the challenges we're facing with with resilience. I mean, just to give you an example now, you know we have the war in Ukraine. Where, where President von der Leyen has already mentioned. She wants the uh, she wants the European Union to be heavily involved in the reconstruction. And although the war is still ongoing, of course, you know we're already starting to think about the reconstruction. And um, I know that there is precedent for using space data uh, to help with reconstruction, uh, as was done in in Italy after the earthquakes there. So um, uh, you know that that is a, a a possible area as well to to keep an eye on. OK, um, so perfect. Thank you very much, um, Philip. So um, now I think we can um, give the floor to our second uh, speaker. Um, so now we will have a presentation from uh, Raffaele Santa Santangelo. Um, so now it's about um, a national project, uh, which is called Mille Infrastrutture, which is a network of um, 80 enterprises uh, to monitor uh, the stability and infrastructure um, So in, uh, in Italy. And um, yeah, I suggest, uh, Raffaele, you take the floor now. And um, if you're ready for your presentation and to share the screen, please go ahead. Morning. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, perfect. You're good to go. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Raffaele Santangelo. I'm the Deputy Program Manager of the Mille Infrastructure Enterprises Network which I will briefly present during my speech. Thanks to the organizers for the invitation to participate in this interesting webinar. Uh, the Italian infrastructural road network has a total length of about 800,000 kilometers, of which the main highways and regional roads represent only 4%. On this limited portion of the network, the number of bridge viaducts and overpasses is about 28,000 units, and the tunnels are about uh, 2,000 units. Each engineering work must be considered as a case due to the constructive peculiarities, the state of degradation, and the hydrological context where it's located. The useful life of infrastructural components manufactured with concrete is approximately 50 years. Here in Italy, most of them were built between 60s and uh, 80s, and therefore they need to be monitored. The Italian infrastructure road and railway, railway works are estimated at just under 2 million units, of which only 3% are currently monitored. This number is so relevant due to geological, morphological, and geographical characteristics of Italian territory that it, that is also naturally predisposed to instability phenomena such as landslides and floods, and there's also high seismicity. In 2019, on the 14th of August, a dramatic event shot political world, road managers, and public uh, opinion, not only at national level. The collapse of the Genoa Bridge, which caused the de death of uh, 43 people, and displacement of about 600 people highlighted the need to intervene on the method, effectiveness, and responsibilities of infrastructure, infra, infrastructure monitoring system. In the last five years, the Italian uh, Ministry of Infrastructure 
has focused its attention on the drafting and publication of technical regulation aimed at improving the methodologies of static and dynamic monitoring of infrastructure. In the, the 2021 the guidelines for classification and management of risk, safety assessment and monitoring of the existing region of highway, national, provincial and metropolitan roads were updated. And the main objectives are the uniformity of risk assessment criteria, the adoption of a single line of attention for all risk and field testing of the guidelines to verify the actual increase in safety level. Similarly, similarly, in this year, the publication of the guidelines for the monitoring of tunnels is expected. Finally, the Ministry has introduced laws and technical standards that require the use to the design company of uh, carry out of technical, economic, and feasibility project of public works using building information modeling solution. The main purpose is to create an open digital database for work with high alert level to gradually achieve the full digitalization of infrastructure network. The definition of an effective monitoring system is important to solve problems such as the long time scales for risk classification, the management of design and construction defects, the lack of funding and very long approval in construction times the increasing also of insurance costs. The innovative monitoring proposed by the Enterprises Network introduces significant benefits in the dynamic verification of the state of infrastructure in different phases of the, in the different phases of their life, starting from construction during the use of uh, road networks and also in periods of ordinary and extraordinary maintenance. After a year of, of work, which began in August of the 2020, when the regional technological district of Basilicata and Liguria, named Ternensit, presented to the Italian government the first project sheet on the innovative monitoring of infrastructure to request funds from the Next Generation EU program, on the 16th of July of the 2021, the Enterprises Network Mille Infrastructure was officially established with the aim of innovating the methods of static and dynamic infrastructure monitoring. At this time, the network is composed of 78 companies, consortia and district, from spin off startups, small and medium, to large companies. I innovate products reality segregated with the universities and research institutes of national and international renown. Mille Infrastructure represents the largest Italian national network of enterprises, an excellent technological interlocutor to address and solve every complex problem of control and monitoring of the national road and rail network. The network provides to its top level structural engineers the collaboration by the best experts in innovative technologies, from satellite to multi sensor drones, from various types of sensor to the artificial intelligence application, with the final aim of implementing a secure IT platform to ensure the protection of national critical infrastructure. A network of uh, complementary skill that sees the major national player in the field of technological innovation as protagonist and uh, which guarantees a national geographical coverage, thus enable cohesion between uh, the various areas in, of the country from south to north. In addition to the main regional technolo technological district, uh, there were the promoters of the initiative together with the Italian Institute of Technology in Genoa and the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna in Pisa. The network includes the Fabre, EUCENTER and Strat Engineering Consortia. Large international companies uh, such as Leonardo, Telespazio, Geos, Engineering, Santer Reply, over 50 small and medium enterprises and through special collaboration agreement, over 50 university and research centers. In our vision, the monitoring is not limited to installing and collecting data from sensors, but involves 
a complex management chain that includes communication data center, analysis and decision support algorithms at national level. In full compliance with the regulation, the network with its associates can design technological solutions capable of responding to the complexity of the requirement. The main object of objectives are the analysis and classification of engineering work that need to be monitored uh, to identify type and number of sensors, the definition of system requirement of the monitoring system, the design and development of the IT monitoring platform, including the data population analysis and monitoring in compliance with guidelines, and the dynamic extension of coverage and follow-up for analysis to ensure continuous system refinement. The enterprise network is implementing an innovative IT platform for monitoring infrastructure that are not considered as isolated elements, but are evaluated as an integrated system with the territory in which they are located. Traditional and innovative sensing technologies are integrated to ensure reliable and accurate measurement of the behavior of the infrastructure and territory system. The integration within the monitoring platform of the most innovative technologies for data analysis, processing, verification, and validation makes the system effective and fast in management of large amount of data. A central role of the system is represented by the stakeholder who express the demand and at the same time validate the effectiveness of the decision support system. Media Infrastructura has 400 experts who provide their contribution in five technical tables. The first table is dedicated to the study and analysis by structural engineers and technicians who know the technical regulation to be applied for the monitoring. The whole of the second, third and fourth technical tables represents the innovative component proposed by the enterprises network respectively in the field of sensor, data processing, analysis, and IT platform. The fifth technical table is the place of confrontation between structural technicians, experts in innovative technologies, and stakeholders. In this section of presentation, I will highlight how mill infrastructure considering the application of advanced differential interferometric SAR techniques in order to monitor the territory and the road infrastructure to be re very relevant. Since 2000, some companies of the network have successfully analyzed with this satellite technique various case studies. The output of some projects developed by Geopark Company are shown in these images. The slow movement of the urban site are affected by subsidence phenomena and bridge and other engineering work have been analyzed. The use of these satellite technologies make possible to quickly identify the areas where potential risk phenomena for the infrastructure stability are taking place, helping to define a priority for the intervention based also on the, on the analysis of velocity map. Middle infrastructure has been involved by Imperia province in the case study of monitoring and design of the structural maintenance intervention on the Monesi Bridge in Liguria region, where also advanced differential interferometric SAR technique have been applied. The technique developed by an Egeos company, a member of the Millen Infrastructure, was applied using ascending and descending Cosmos Kemed SAR dataset in the period between January 2018 and December 2021. The main result is the persistent scatterer mean velocity map. It reports the measured mean velocity along the satellite line of sight upon particular sites. The figures at the right side show the two velocity maps carried out, carried out using ascending and descending Cosmos SkyMap dataset. The combination of the mean velocity map based on the two geometries permits to measure the east, west, and vertical component of the mean velocity of the persistent scattered pairs. 
the yellow square identifies the location of the Monesi Bridge, on which the presence of blue dots show that average velocity of movement with a certain magnitude have been recorded, especially in the east-west direction. These results have been integrated with those deriving from other monitoring techniques, and the working group is currently planning intervention to mitigate the risk of bridge instability. The enterprise network mill infrastructure was a task to aggregate best national excellence to increase the safety of transportation in infrastructure by implementing a monitoring system that enables decision makers to make informed decisions. The network can immediately deploy key assets of its members in order to increase the effectiveness of monitoring by reducing costs and implementation time. In near future, sharing the circulation approach, circular approach, middle infrastructure will be able to implement research and development models in the field of material processing and monitoring, monitoring of their state of health to bring down barriers in use of recycled materials also in the construction sector. Thanks a lot for, for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Rafael. And um, yeah, I'm I'm not seeing any questions for the moment in the chat. So again, uh, for the audience, please uh, do not hesitate and and use the chat for for your questions. So um, maybe I can start with um, with an overall uh, question. So um, because this this uh, project, so it's uh, it's a national um, it's a national network. Um, do you think that this um, this model can can also be implemented um, in or replicated in in other countries? Yes, uh, yes, of course. Uh, mm, I add that it, it, it is desirable. Uh, each European country could uh, could adopt a shared model, models that takes its cue from the experience of the Italian Enterprises Network Mill Infrastructure and uh, define community standards uh, to be respected uh, of the um, of the static and dynamic monitoring uh, system for for. Uh, for a general level, I think that could be desirable. All right. Um, okay. So um, maybe we can uh, we can just uh, move towards the second speaker, and then uh, we can come back if there are any other questions, uh, and if we have some uh, some time left at the end of the session, we can uh, so maybe have the, the other questions. So thanks a lot, and um, yeah. Let's uh, may maybe address the uh, other questions later. Um, so now we can um, move towards our um, third and last speaker of the day. Uh, so I invite Ariana Garcia uh, to take the floor. Uh, so she will present. Um, so this time we are focusing on the European project. Um, so we're going from the from the national level to a European um, project. Uh, and this one is uh, on um, uh, applications related to uh, GNSS, so satellite navigation um, for the transformation of roads and uh, railways, um, sharing digital infrastructures and safety certifications processes uh, to lower energy consumption and uh, pollution. Uh, so, Ayana, please uh, go ahead. Do, do you see my screen? Yes, you're all, uh, all good okay. here. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ariana Persia from Radio Labs Consortium. Uh, that is a coordinator of uh, Helmet project that uh, I'm going to present. This is the agenda of my speech. First of all, uh, we will see how the Helmet project fits into the context of the evolution of uh, transport system and critical infrastructure and application, in particular for the intelligent transportation systems. Uh, we will continue with the Helmet project uh, overview and the main details about the Helmet consortium, project goals, motivation and ambition. Uh, then we will see the project workflow with the high level description of the project activities and uh, we will move on the description of uh, Helmet architecture design up uh, to the proof of concept activities uh, regarding the demo carried out last month in Rome. Uh, finally, the conclusion with uh, some points of uh, possible uh, future developments. 
The transport sector is rapidly changing, moving uh, towards increasing the safe and sustainable mobility solution uh, thanks to the new ICT technologies. Uh, in this context, particular interest is reserved for the rail context, uh, in which about 57,000 uh, kilometers of line will be equipped with the ERTMS system in the near future and to the vehicular context in which vehicles will be increasingly equipped with system and technologies for assistant drives and uh, driving. Up to reach 15% of all new vehicles uh, sold in 2030 fully autonomous. Uh, new challenges in these fields uh, will be the resiliency, autonomy, sustainability of the transport systems. At this day, the GNSS-based uh, priorities will be the use of Galileo constellation in addition to GPS, the multi-sensor uh, technologies with the, the usage of uh, GNSS information with onboard sensor data like AMU uh, that ensure the resilience of the system and uh, multimodal augmentation network in order to reach the uh, cost efficiency. In this slide, you, you can see an overview of the Helmet project that aim to develop satellite navigation technologies for eco-friendly, uh, smart and innovative transport sector that makes the most of digitization and automation. Uh, the target applications are mainly true, as you can see from the video. The connected and driverless car and the train management and automation, but also the unmanned aerial vehicle for surveillance roads and uh, railways. This is in order to make the transport, uh, the transportation systems uh, more safe, sustainable, accessible and reliable by optimizing new technological infrastructure. The main goals of the Helmet project are the development of multimodal, multi-sensor integrity monitoring architecture uh, based on GNSS-based solution, introducing a integrity localization determination system both for car and trains, uh, and, uh, but also with the unmanned aerial vehicles for monitoring. The assessment of the system performance by a proof of concept in, um, in a real mobility environment, in this case uh, in Rome as said before. At the last, um, but very important point, the drawing up of a roadmap for exploitation, standardization and certification of helmet results, with reference to multimodal augmentation and integrity monitoring network and high integrity and accuracy onboard unit algorithms for rail and roads. Re um, referring to the three uh, main pillars mentioned above, Helmet exploit the expert price experience at cutting technologies available in the state of art for design the multimodal augmentation network for land transportation and UAB for, uh, at high integrity and high accuracy. Uh, provide for the usage of uh, the cost device for high accuracy and uh, integrity algorithms and uh, aims at the commercialization of uh, GNSS-based solution for land transportation and the certification in road and rail cost context. The AMET is a multidisciplinary team, including a research center and an industrial partner. Uh, among the research center, uh, we have Radio Labs, University of Partsubisse, and the LR. Uh, on the other hand, and we have the industrial partner, ITC, Sojay, and uh, Roboato. In this slide, we can see uh, briefly. Uh, we, can, we can briefly see um, what are the main work packages of the of the project, uh, starting from the definition of the requirements of the helmet platform, uh, passing uh, uh, through the design and development activity up to the uh, demonstration dissemination uh, of result. In, uh, in this slide, you can see the helmet architecture 
uh, in which the different infrastructure segments and the mobile onboard units are highlighted uh, with reference to the three different transportation sectors, in particular automotive, rail and UAV as well as the GNS multimodal augmentation network of first and second level that serve to ensure the position estimation with the high accuracy and high integrity. Uh, specifically, uh, as said before, uh, the helmet uh, multimodal arch architecture is designed to operate in three different uh, application segments. Uh, the tar railway, uh, automated car, and uh, a manned aerial vehicle segment. It includes an augmentation subsystem, a communication subsystem, and a multi-sensor onboard subsystem. Uh, the augmentation sub subsystem is the same for the three segments, with the different service level based on the network uh, of infrastructure while the communication and the onboard sound system are tailored to each application. Going uh, into the details of the architecture, the augmentation subsystem provides the augmentation and uh, GNSS integrity messages, uh, while the multimodal multisensory uh, onboard subsystem provides the requirement uh, system information such as uh, position, velocity and time, but also the attitude of the vehicles. Um, um, it includes a set of the sensor, like the Genesis receiver, IMU, cameras, and uh, leader. Uh, there are also a communication subsystem for the interaction uh, among the augmentation network and the onboard unit. And finally, the processing uh, unit that, that is responsible of integrating the measurement uh, uh, from GNSS uh, re receiver uh, with uh, other sensor uh, data, um, but also uh, PVT and protection level estimation. Uh, this, slide, uh, this slide describes uh, in detail the onboard uh, unit architecture, uh, respectively for uh, three different operational uh, contexts, uh, which are uh, railway, uh, roads, and uh, UAD. O on this, I go fast, but uh, we mentioned the, the the key aspect of the development of the, these components that are the use of the GNSS augmentation information, the protection from uh, local uh, GNSS3, and the multi-sensor approach. Uh, all of this to have uh, high accuracy, high integrity, and uh, high availability of the system. Uh, Uh, moving on, the test phase in a real mobility environment of helmet uh, solution. Uh, the joint demo was carried out uh, with Roboato and DLR for automotive part and rail part for Radio Lab Sci. Uh, in, the, in the last month uh, on the Roma Fiumicino Highway with the start and end test at the University of Roma 3 in Rome, uh, in which there is a one of the associated laboratories of the Redilux Consortium. Regarding the, the demo approach for rail part, uh, since um, we didn't still have a real train available for helmet project. As the radio labs, uh, we had simulated the behavior of the train with a vehicle bound to move along a predefined route. Uh, specifically, we have generated a track database uh, with the data recording on the Roma Fiumicino way, and then we are refined the calculation of uh, PVT with the use of uh, commercial RTK services. Once the track database and the grant tool uh, were, uh, were created, uh, we had other test campaigns on the same road, passing on the same line, uh, to carry out the further acquisition uh, and the data processing for real time, but also for processing analysis. Uh, as you can see from the figures, for the field test, we have uh, set up 
the radiolux vehicles with the GNSS antenna and receiver, uh, the onboard unit on PC uh, with the Virgilio simulator running, uh, Virgilio that is a, a radiolux onboard unit software, uh, GoPro cameras and uh, 316 camera uh, in order to acquire, acquire environmental context data for deep analysis in post-processing phase. The next step uh, will be the use a, a train running in a real uh, railway uh, for testing the high accuracy and uh, integrity on board the unit. In this slide, however, you can see the equipment of the robo auto vehicles that was in charge of uh, the development and testing of the onboard unit for automotive part. Um, while at the right, an image of the start of the joint acquisition campaign in Rome. Uh, for concluding, uh, the key aspect uh, investigated uh, within the Helmet project concern the design and development of a multimodal augmentation platform um, for rail, roads and drones, uh, a safety framework for roads, uh, vehicle harmonized with avionic and uh, rail uh, best practice, the multi-sensor uh, onboard unit with the advanced integrity monitoring capability, including the statistic and knowledge of, uh, about the, the local hazard, and uh, finally the contribution to the standardization uh, activity carried out by FTCM uh, Special Committee. Um, Regarding the future development of the project instead, uh, already from the result currently arising uh, from this project, interest is growing in the future possible collaboration to move to the operational phase of the helmet solution or to extend its functionalities with other um, research projects uh, Potential customers or stakeholders uh, in Italy, like for example ANAS and RFI, has been identified that, key, that can represent the end user of the Helmet uh, platform uh, or collaborate with the Helmet consortium to carry out uh, a further uh, development of uh, architecture uh, toward the operational uh, phase. Uh, I conclude my presentation and I uh, thank you for this opportunity to present the Helmet project in this context. Thank you, Cornil. Thank you, uh, Ariana, for your presentation. Um, so maybe, uh, I, so in, in the chat, I um, because I see that we're running uh, late now, but uh, in the chat, I shared the, the link for the next session and also there you can find more information about the previous sessions and also uh, the recording for this session. It will uh, be uploaded, um, yeah, after, of course, after we close the event. Um, but so for now, I would maybe I'll just ask you a question because I don't see uh, a question for now, but um, um, so I would just like to ask uh, from your experience, uh, what was the, um, what are the takeaways from from this European collaboration or this project? What are you, for instance, um, I mean, what, what are for you the, the main uh, takeaways uh, from this kind of collaboration, also for the future of the, the project um, and, and for similar uh, European um, collaborations? What, what is the, the 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 main? What are the main benefits from it? Yes, it is important that uh, uh, during the Helmet project we we have uh, designed, as said before, a, a platform the, for different uh, mean, uh, transportation means. It is important you know, that, that the user can be benefit of the improvement of localization determination system for different application. Uh, in this phase of the helmet, we we have designed a development the this helmet solution. But with other collaboration and new opportunity with the, the different uh, in industry and uh, research center, uh, we can move on to the. Um, development and in particular operational phase of the helmet. 
this is an important aspect uh, for, for us. The main okay. object of the Elmet project. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and then uh, I see one final question. So this uh, question is actually for uh, Rafael Santangelo. Um, so it's regarding the synthetic uh, uh, aperture radar data technique for uh, bridge monitoring. So what may be some of the limitations uh, in terms of accuracy? Does the number of satellite images available affect the result, for instance? Uh, so Rafael, I don't know if you um, would like to take the floor again. Yes. Uh, yes, um, surely the interferometric techniques rather from satellite can be used uh, with uh, some limitation. It depends on uh, the exposition of, uh, of the territory and the infrastructure and um, because it depends on the, on the line of sight of the satellite. Uh, and uh, also with these techniques, uh, it's possible uh, to detect all these low movements, so uh, not not uh, not all kind of movement, movements can be detected with the use of this satellite application. And uh, for instance, in the application that we made on um, uh, on uh, Monesi Bridge, uh, we need uh, uh, to have uh, more than 30 images uh, and. Uh, and uh, and the number, the minimum number of, Im of images that uh, you need to have uh, uh, depends on the on the kind of constellation you use. Uh, 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 on the same uh, on the same project, uh, we are also testing Sentinel data, and in that case, we need uh, more than 50 images, uh, considering the method that actually we are using, and. Uh, Obviously, satellite application uh, uh, do not replace the other uh, monitoring system. It's a new way to integrate uh, information to identify priority of intervention in particular condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's complementary with uh, other techniques, of course. Yeah, of, yeah. of course. Yeah. Okay, uh, perfect. So I think um, we can uh, now close the session. So um, we have covered more than one hour. So um, I would like just to thank everyone. Uh, so all the speakers and then also uh, the organizations. So also uh, Nereus and, uh, and Margareta, thank you very much. Um, and then uh, so in the chat, I refer once again to the link um, for the next session. So there you can register. You can uh, find all the summaries for the previous sessions. And um, yeah, we hope to see you uh, then uh, in, next, uh, in the next session. So that will be by the end of June. So thank you very much and um, hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cornel. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Cornel. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.